mystery established the new covenant of reconciliation. Grant that all who have been reborn into the fellowship of Christ's body may show forth in their lives what they profess by their faith. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever.
Please be seated. How wonderful to see you all. Thank you for coming to share this celebration. And because it's my celebration, I got to pick the lessons. <laughs> I love to share the messages they provide us about the way God relates to humanity and what that implies for our own identity as images of God. You're not going to hear anything new from me today. You're going to hear my favorites in the top 10 list of the best news ever. <laughs> the first reading is from Genesis of the account of creation in which God plants a garden and fashions human beings to be heard to care for it. The language and structure of the story are clear that they were created as equals, the woman and the man. They were told that the trees in the garden would supply their food, but they must not eat the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of the Lord and evil. To do so, they were persuaded by another voice that if they knew where the people, they would be all God, which sounded attractive. So they ate the forbidden fruit, and it was downhill from there. <laughs> now their relationship to God, to each other, to the creatures of earth and the earth itself, were damaged and broken. And now they were so the lesson we heard today tells us that God expected them from the garden and posted armed children as the sentries, which has often been interpreted as punishment. And I don't hear it that way. Listen to what God says. See, the humans have become like us, knowing good and evil. And now, what if they were to stretch out their hands and eat the fruit of the tree of life and live in this brokenness forever. Live forever in estrangement and pain. God was not willing to have that happen. So out of love for them, God protected them from an eternal life laden with the sorrows brought on by human sin and among those sorrows are the sexism and racism which have marred human life, predominantly because sin has extended even to the interpretation of scripture. Eventually, covenants were made. God's expectations were made clear. Love me, love me with everything that is in you and love your neighbor as yourself. Mercy and justice were to be primary aspects of loving God and others, and even those who were not originally defined as neighbors were to be included. Any wayfarers and sojourners, today we call them refugees and immigrants, were to be treated with respect and with justice and mercy. The entire sweep of the biblical story carries these themes forward. God's desire is to be in the most loving relationship possible with humanity and to have us love one another. Prophets were sent to remind the people using a variety of images, but always with the goal of repairing the damaged relationships and living faithfully. The message was always that God wanted us Come back. I love you. I want your love. That love cannot be coerced. It can only be chosen. And we could not or would not live as God desires. So God did a new thing. Have you seen those billboards? I see them every so often. They're, they're supposed to be messages from God. So there's a phrase that's in quotes, and then the citation is God. Well, I've, I've seen this one that says, don't make me come down there. <laughs> Which again, 
makes God sound angry and threatening rather than ultimately loving. But that's what we say God has already done because we simply were not able to fix ourselves up and live faithfully. God has already come among us, getting alongside us, sharing all that is very good about human life and becoming vulnerable to all that is worst about it. We humans can be creative, good-natured, compassionate, and kind. We can be helpful and filled with good humor, and we can love. But we can also be indifferent and hard-hearted, hostile and violent, cruel and murderous. So the eternal word through whom all things came into being now took on our being in Jesus. And Jesus showed us what the love of God is really like. Jesus healed and prayed and taught, often reinterpreting the teachings in ways that were not well received. He rubbed elbows with all the wrong people. He spoke to women in public. He interacted with Gentiles and Samaritans and ate meals with notorious sinners. And he proclaimed over and over the reign of God. God's kingdom is already among you and within you, he said. Seek it. Ask for it. Knock on the door with such energy and determination that you will find yourselves already inside it, here and now. And he used parables to help us understand that God's purpose and desire for us is forgiveness and reconciliation, and that everyone is included. We are not allowed to define anyone as not my neighbor. What Jesus said and did was infuriating. He was viewed as a dangerous influence, and by the time crowds gathered to greet him entry into Jerusalem, shouting, Hosanna to the one who comes in the name of the Lord. The establishment was ready to do whatever was necessary to eliminate him. We all know that part of the story. The last meal with his disciple, disciples, his anguished prayer, his arrest in the dead of night, the interrogation by the Sanhedrin and the Roman governor, then the torture, the vicious ridicule, the cruel public execution. And what was God's response to this thoroughgoing rejection? What was God's response to the crucifixion? You know the answer to this. <laughs> the resurrection, of course. In the resurrection, God says to us, do you get it now? What you have done is not bad enough. There is nothing you can do that will make me stop loving you. Even if you deliberately try, you cannot kill my love for you. God takes on human life in Jesus, becoming subject to death, and then rises to bring humanity out of the grave dug by greed and selfishness and unforgiveness and the lack of justice and mercy and compassion. The passage we heard from John's Gospel today is about the first encounter of Jesus and his group of disciples after his resurrection. His greeting to them was, Peace be with you. As Abba has sent me, so I send you. Then he breathed the Holy Spirit into them and reminded them that being sent would mean learning to forgive. A couple of important points here. These same followers had been with Jesus on the night before his arrest and trial, when he had said to them, I'm giving you a new commandment, that you love one another as I love you. The Greek word used by the Gospel writer for this new commandment about love is agape. This is the unquenchable, eternal love of God for every person, 
It is the love which longs for reciprocation, but does not depend on it. It also includes a level of sacrifice, just as the incarnation, the human life and death of Jesus included sacrifice. This passage has often been described as an encounter between the risen Lord and the faithful 11 apostles. But Raymond Brown, a Roman Catholic priest and scholar, and widely recognized authority on anything in scripture written by anyone named John, <laughs> says that we must be careful about the actual vocabulary of this passage. When this gospel writer uses the Greek word apostoloi, he is speaking of the 12. When he uses the Greek word mathetais, he is describing the larger group of disciples who traveled with Jesus and which included the women. In this passage, in which Jesus bestows the Holy Spirit and sends them out, just as he has been sent out by Abba, the word used is mathetais. The women were there. They were included in the new commandment to love as Jesus loves, with the never failing sacrificial love of God. And they were included in what the church would later describe as ordination. It's worth noting that the apostle Thomas was not actually there, though even he was presumably included in this commissioning. A further word about agape. Another of my favorite passages is from John's Gospel, and it's the account of Jesus meeting some of the disciples along the shore of the Sea of Tiberias. He directs them to a large catch of fish and shares breakfast with them. And then he does something extremely important. He asks Peter whether he loves him. Simon, son of Jonas, do you love me more than these? And Peter says, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. In our English translations, all we see is that Jesus asks three times. And this is very dear because we remember that after Jesus' arrest, uh, Peter had denied knowing him three times. It appears that what Jesus is doing is giving Peter the chance to sort of make up for those denials. But when we look at the, the Greek, we see that more is going on. Jesus is using a form of the word agape, the eternal, unquenchable, sacrificial love that God has for us. But Peter, in his response, is using the word philo. Philo, uh, you know that Philadelphia is the city of brotherly love. Philo is affection that we have toward people we're already fond of, like family and dear friends. There's nothing wrong with philo. It's perfectly fine, but it falls far short of agape. Even so, Jesus takes what Peter is able to offer and gives him a mission. Feed my lambs, shepherd my sheep, I find this very encouraging. Even when Peter can't promise what is asked, Jesus takes what is offered and uses it for good. But there's more. When Jesus asks the third time, Simon, son of Jonas, do you love me? The word Jesus uses is philo. Peter can't promise agape. So Jesus gets alongside him and asks him to commit to what he can. This is the forgiveness Jesus was talking about when he entered the locked room and breathed the Holy Spirit into the men and women gathered there. This is the refusal to fixate on what is inadequate, concentrating instead on what is faithful and good. St. Paul, writing at least 30 years before John's Gospel was written, did his best to explain it in letters to early communities of faith to help them understand that in Jesus, the Christ, 
God has reconciled all of creation and has made it possible for us to share in the joy God originally intended us to have, the joy of mutual love and encouragement, of raising each other up instead of tearing each other down. But St. Paul was a product of his own time, and so were those who read and interpreted his letters. So even when he wrote such things as, in Christ there is no Jew nor Greek, no male nor female, or the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, or when anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Those messages were given somewhat less weight than the ones which seem to justify keeping women subordinate to men and slaves subordinate to masters. But Paul was clear about this. All who have joined themselves to Christ are now to participate in the ministry of reconciliation. All are included. All bring something worthwhile to the enterprise of helping the world more closely resemble the kingdom Jesus proclaimed. All are called to the rigors and joys of agape. For nearly 20 years, I have had the honor and privilege of serving this diocese as your bishop. And during these years, I have seen this kind of love grow among you. I have watched you draw closer to each other, forging partnerships, discerning God's call to serve the world around you. I've seen you embrace the truth that Jesus did not command us to agree. He commanded us to love each other. So you have been able to struggle with divisive issues without walking away from each other. I have seen and experienced your forgiveness. I have admired your willingness to advocate for justice and peace and to deepen your own faith and to widen the embrace of the church. None of us is as we were in 1997, probably a good thing, and I'm more than grateful that I can say that together we've done our best to cooperate with the Holy Spirit, who does not call us to remain static, but rather to be restless about learning what agape will mean for us tomorrow and in the years to come. Next week, we will have another bishop, and her leadership will challenge us all in new ways, and that is a very good thing because there is always more to do. As our friend Father John Roof used to remind us every year at convention, we have not yet brought in the kingdom of God. <laughs> but we have all we need. We've been entrusted with all kinds of resources and the gift of each other. And above all, we have food for the journey. When we gather, as we do today, to give thanks and praise when we extend our hands to receive the body of Christ and to drink from the cup of the new covenant. What we are being given is the fruit of the tree of life, new life, which if we will allow it to nourish us, can strengthen us to help the world around us more closely resemble the kingdom Jesus proclaimed. And that would be good news. May it be so. No, just give me the crozier. For what may be the last time, I'm going to remind you that the creed is not a prayer. The amen at the end of the creed means something like, yes! It means, sign me up. It doesn't mean I thoroughly understand it all. It just means I believe it. I set my heart on it. And I allow it to have a claim on me. So I'll invite you to stand as you're able and announce proclaim the things we set our hearts on. We believe in one God, 
the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is, seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and he made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Let us pray for the church and the world. Grant, almighty God, that all who confess your name may be united in your truth, live together in your love, and reveal your glory in the world. Lord, in your mercy. Guide the people of this land and of all the nations in the way of justice and peace, that we may honor one another and serve the common good. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Give us all a reverence for the earth as your own creation that we may use its resources rightly in the service of others and to your honor and glory. <coughs> Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Bless all whose lives are closely linked with ours and grant that we may serve Christ in them and love one another as he loves us. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Comfort and heal all those who suffer in body, mind, or spirit. Give them courage and hope in their troubles and bring them the joy of your salvation. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. We commend to your mercy all who have died, that your will for them may be fulfilled. And we pray that we may share with all your saints in your eternal kingdom. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. O God of unchangeable power and eternal light, look favorably on your whole church that wonderful and sacred mystery. By the effectual working of your providence, carry out in tranquility the plan of salvation. Let the whole world see and know that things which were cast down are being raised up, and things which had grown old are being made new, and that all things are being brought to their perfection by him through whom all things were made, your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord 
who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. La paz del Señor, la paz del Señor be always with you. That was pretty good. <laughs> that was pretty good. Peace all over you. Peace. It's great. Peace, Jennifer. We hope all of you will be able to uh, attend the extended celebration uh, at the Indiana State Museum. Lots of parking down there, so don't worry about parking. Um, it's going to be just a lot of fun, so I hope you can join us. How shall we thank St. Christopher for uh, hosting this celebration? Uh, and for helping to make all of the liturgical arrangements. <laughs> we especially thank uh, Marilyn Kaiser and Michael Messina and and, and, Rob, and Robert, who is the, is the faithful uh, musician here at St. Christopher, um, they are all extremely gifted, and we're very fortunate uh, to have them uh, attending to our musical portions today. Um, especially now that they've gone now, but the, the choir from St. Richard's School, how wonderful. We should have it noted that they have come. <laughs> Um, communion will be at two standing stations here and at one in the back, and ushers will help guide you uh, at the proper time. If you are um, new uh, to the way we do these things in the Episcopal Church, um, when we receive uh, the sacred bread, extend your hands this way. You can eat the bread and drink from the chalice, or you can keep the bread and dip it in the chalice. You don't have to have the wine. Um, if you would like to participate, but you don't want to take communion, you can cross your arms over your chest and receive a blessing. But we want you to know that you're most welcome. I know there was something else I was going to tell you. <laughs> the offering today, uh, the gifts of money, will be uh, divided uh, between ministries in our uh, Companion Diocese of Brasilia, and we have Bishop Mauricio with us. And though we currently do not have a formal partnership with a diocese in South Sudan, there is still much need for the work of reconciliation. It's being, being undertaken by the churches, and, and we can contribute to that work. Um, we have a way to do that, even without having a companion diocese. So I bid you be generous. 
Let us with gladness present the offerings and oblations of our lives and labor unto the Lord.
Where are you going, Brantley? We place on the altar gifts of bread and wine in confidence that God will receive these gifts from us and by the power of the Holy Spirit will transform them to be for us the body and blood of Christ. We place on the altar gifts of money in confidence that God will receive these gifts and bless them and return them to us to be used for faithful and holy purposes and as a reminder that all God's gifts must be used in those ways. We also place on the altar the things of our own lives. Whatever there is that needs to be healed or strengthened or forgiven or renewed. And we do that with the confidence that whatever we are able to offer, God will accept. And we will be blessed and given back to ourselves more nearly the image of God we're created to be. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We give thanks to you, O God, for the goodness and love which you have made known to us in creation, in the calling of Israel to be your people, in your word spoken through the prophets, and above all, in the word made flesh, Jesus, your Son. For in these last days you sent him to be incarnate from the Virgin Mary 
to be the Savior and Redeemer of the world. In him you have delivered us from evil and made us worthy to stand before you. In him you have brought us out of error into truth, out of sin into righteousness, out of death into life. On the night before he died for us, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sin. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, according to his command, O Father, we remember his death, we proclaim his resurrection, we await his coming in glory, and we offer our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving to you, O Lord of all, presenting to you from your creation this bread and this wine. We pray you, gracious God, to send your Holy Spirit upon these gifts, that they may be the sacrament of the body of Christ and his blood of the new covenant. Unite us to your Son in his sacrifice, that we may be acceptable through him, being sanctified by the Holy Spirit. In the fullness of time, put all things in subjection under your Christ, and bring us to that heavenly country where with all your saints we may enter the everlasting heritage of your sons and daughters. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, the firstborn of all creation, the head of the church and the author of our salvation. By him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit. All honor and glory is yours, almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. As our Savior Christ has taught us, we now pray.
These are the gifts of God for the people of God. They are holy gifts for holy people. Christ, the bread of heaven. <coughs> the body of Christ, the bread of heaven. The body of Christ, the bread of heaven. The blood of Christ, the cup of salvation.
In thanksgiving, let us pray together. Almighty and ever-living God, we thank you for feeding us with the spiritual food of the most precious body and blood of your Son, our Savior Jesus Christ, and for assuring us in these holy mysteries that we are living members of the body of your Son and heirs of your eternal kingdom. And now, Father, send us out to do the work you have given us to do, to love and serve you as faithful witnesses of Christ our Lord. To him, to you, and to the Holy Spirit, be honor and glory, now and forever. Amen. Our help is in the name of the Lord. of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you now and remain with you forever. Amen. Now before the deacon dismisses us, uh, how will we show our appreciation to the choristers in the, in the group and the procedure?